will be chaired by Dick Moore, who is Director of Technology at UFI Learning Direct and a trustee of ALT and Chair of the ALT Publications Committee. So I'm grateful to Dick for agreeing to chair this session led by Julian Harty of Google. And that's all I'm going to say. So thank you. Thanks, Fred. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody here. I have to say, it's great to be asked to chair this because otherwise I've had to pay to attend. It's the sort of event that I certainly would have paid to attend, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what Julian's got to say. We are, we find ourselves, we find ourselves, I believe, on the cusp of the next major generation of computing. We had mainframes, we had minis. We had PCs, we had laptops, and anybody who's been paying attention in the last 12 months can't have failed to have noticed the impact that both the iPhone and the Android phone have made. Do we really think that in five years' time there won't be more of that? What impact does it have on, on learning and teaching? What, what impact is that going to have on inclusion? And I think there are two, two big companies lining up to fight for that new ground. One of them is clearly Apple. I spent yesterday afternoon in the Apple shop. And the other one is Google. And I think we have a, um, a speaker today. But when I went out on the internet, when I spoke to Julian earlier on today, he said, just make up five, five things about me and see if they spot the mistakes. So he, he was a founder member of the Lewis Institute. He, um, in a previous life, he's done avionics. And um, he describes himself as a test juggler. I'm looking forward to hearing about them. So over to Julian. And if you want to ask questions, you're happy to take questions yes. as we go? Yes. Over to you, Julian. Thank you. Thank you. I really am happy to take questions anyway through this talk. Uh, the purpose of me being here is to try and help you solve whatever it interests you in terms of technology, in terms of questions, ideas. Um, I'm fairly unstructured, as you'll see, uh, which may be a good thing or a bad thing. And uh, I'll probably go off the point, so please bring me back if I'm going too far off the point. So the first thing is, what am I doing here at all? Uh, basically, I'm passionate about having um, things work for people, technology work for people. And it bugs me when technology doesn't. It really bugs me when people have to adapt to technology rather than the other way around. And that's how I fell into software testing about 10 years ago, when I realized I wasn't a very good developer. And I thought, well, how can I help and show the quality of software well by testing it? And so I set up my own company. 10 years ago, it seems like a very long time ago, and um, fell into software testing from that perspective. I've been at Google just under four years. Uh, I speak a lot of conferences, which is how I ended up here, because Sal Cook picked on me after speaking at the RNIB conference where someone else picked on me to get me to come. So that seems to be the way I do this. And I'm doing this on my own um, without formal sponsorship from Google, but they tolerate me, so, which is a good thing. So um, I promise I'm going to talk about some Google technologies, and I'll try and mention these to give you an idea of what might be possible. I'll also try and give you an insight into the company, a little bit about how the company operates and works, because it's quite a big company now, and most of you know Google as the ever-present search engine that you probably mostly use daily. But it, that isn't the company in many ways, and by trying to explain a little bit more about how the company operates, hopefully I'll encourage you to try some things out that you might think, well, hang on, I'm not Google, I'm just this small person with too much work to do. What happens now? I can't do any of these things. Well, most of Google's successful technology have come from two or three people. So not 20 or 30, not 50 or 100, but two or three. So one of the reasons I'm here is because I strongly believe that by talking to various people, both within Google and outside Google, that I can encourage change. Now, it may be that some of you end up doing the real change, and my job was to encourage you. It may be that I have some part to play in that, and that's why I'm here. So I may be just the messenger. I may actually actually do some work. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is Google Wave. Now, I have Arthur Ortega in the front row here. He works for Yahoo. He's blind. I mailed him about a month ago and said, Arthur, I'd like to really use Google Wave just for a trial with all the people who organize the conference. What do you think? Because I know that it doesn't work for blind people. So he gave me a bit of a hard time and promised to give me a bashing through the sessions, which is fine. Um, but so we can, we can look at that as a problem. We can say, well, hang on, Google's got this brilliant new technology. They've had 
end developers work on it for several years. Google's a multi-billion dollar company. How is it that they haven't solved this problem? Surely they could at least have done the basics for blind people. So I could hang my head in shame and say, well, yes, I agree, I'm not very happy with it either. Uh, and it's one of the things that I try to work on and address at Google. But let's do it from a different perspective. I went to Sydney uh, in the summer, or well, their winter last year, and when I arrived there, I said, oh, I, I'm interested in accessibility. He said, oh, you must talk to the Deaf Association. I said, okay, fine. And so I was asked to talk to the Australian Deaf Association, and for them, WAVE was revolutionary. For the first time, deaf people didn't need a human with a computer to interact between them and who they wanted to talk to. Is anyone deaf here? I realize that sounds like a silly question to ask. But deaf people typically will have someone who does text to uh, type in translation one way or the other. So they type, a human speaks for them, the RID provides a service, or vice versa. So Google Wave is a real-time technology. It means that as I type each character, and I'm listening to Guy here typing on his fancy little keyboard, each character is transmitted and can be edited by someone else in real time. So this is not sending an email and someone replies to an email. This is not I am. How many of you use I am here? OK, about half of you. So I am, you type some stuff. And by the time you've typed your 20 characters, whatever it is, normally someone else will type something else. And what you've just typed is a waste of time because you're no longer on the same question anymore. So Google Wave actually brings that together so it happens within the same sub-second. You type, they type. Now, it's a bit of a weird technology in that it's sort of looking for a home. It's been invented, and it's invented based on the premise of, let's imagine that we didn't have to live with 30 years of history. So email's been around for 30 years now, and I've certainly used it for 20. Let's imagine we don't need to worry about that anymore. Let's imagine we don't need to worry about modems anymore. Let's just look at what technology could do in terms of communication. And that's where Wave came from, brand new from the ground up. And one of the challenges we have is to marry it with the old world, which is email and chat and the rest of it. So I looked at a conference, a Google testing automation conference, so deeply technical. And we had about 100 people in the room, so slightly more than here. And we gave them all accounts to Google Wave. And what would happen is someone would take notes. So a guy's taking notes now. I'm picking on him slightly. And I assume that guy's only going to get a subset of what I say. Is that a fair, Guy? Uh, doing OK so far. You've got 100% <laughs> of everything I say. Not, not, not 100%, but uh, okay. So I was at the Microsoft um, event a couple of months ago, the end of last year. And they had two people. And the first one typed in most of the words, but there were lots of typos and mistakes. And the second one corrected it about a minute later. And this was a very well-run event by Microsoft. So Google Wave allows you to do that in real time. And it means that, I'll pick on you, the gentleman with the pink shirt over there, and the woman sitting next to you, you could be typing parts of this down, and then you get tired and you start to daydream. Someone else has just picked up and continues typing the same document in real time. Someone else over there noticed that I said this weird word that everyone else has misspelled. So they correct it. So 10 seconds later, at the end, is a much more polished piece of work than otherwise be the case. So going back to inclusion then, one of the things that is helping is the Deaf Association were really keen to use this because it gave them an advantage. It meant that they could compete at the same level as people who weren't deaf. And what I hope, and what Arthur and I are talking about um, separately, um, is how can we do something similar for blind people? How can we do something similar for other impairments? And to me, it's not really about impairment, it's about getting technology to adjust to the needs of the person. And when we can get that solved, and it's an imperfect science, then we've done something useful. I'm pleased with it. Are there any questions on Google Wave? And I'll move on to the next thing. So the next thing, then, is Chrome OS. Now, I happen to be the test engineer on Chrome OS in Europe. Sounds grand, doesn't it? It means I'm the only one. But never mind. So Chrome OS runs on these things. These are called netbooks. This one I bought from I think Amazon, and it costs just over 200 quid. And it's cheap, it's cheerful, it's a little computer, it's got a battery in, it's got a crappy keyboard. Sorry, it's um, a, uh, a cost-effective keyboard and uh, a cost-effective mouse pad. Um, and these devices you can now buy for 200 pounds. If I run a traditional operating system, I'll just be general and say Windows, but Ubuntu is the same sort of thing, and I count this on, it takes about five minutes to start the computer up and get everything up and running. 
So that's the first problem this time. Now let's imagine I want to use this to take notes. Well, the guy thankfully can type immediately. But with this thing, I've got to wait five minutes before it comes online and then type on it. And that's too long. The second thing is, how many of you have got home computers? Has anyone not got a home computer? Okay, so that's that to me is a home computer. So you've got a home computer. How many of you have got antivirus software? How many of you have got anti-spam software? Okay. How many of you like having antivirus software and anti-spam software? And how many of you like the security problems? You know, this website wants to do the following, yes, no, cancel. How many of you are confident with the answer? Any of you? Seriously? Okay, so we've got one or two people who are halfway confident. So the way that Google's tried to approach this is to solve two problems. One is how long it takes to start the stupid computer before I can use it. And the idea is a few seconds. This one currently takes 13 seconds from code. And it's an off-the-shelf computer running the off-the-shelf hacky alpha of our software. So expect that to get better. The second thing is there's no antivirus software on it. There's no anti-spam software on it. Um, oh, and how many of you have to do you know, like Windows Update? You know, your computer's downloading stuff, uh, you're reusing in the middle of the night if you're lucky. Um, you did save your work last night, didn't you? Um, and I'm not complaining about Microsoft. I think what they've done is great. I, I'm really impressed by them as a company in terms of security on the rest of it. But from a user's perspective, they haven't solved the problem yet. So they've halfway solved it. They've addressed a lot of the problems, but the users still have to make too many decisions. So Chrome OS from the ground up is going to be secure. I'm responsible for testing security of Chrome OS, by the way. So we can come back and board in a year or two. Uh, anyway, so um, the, the idea is to get rid of all these problems. Now, you may say, well, okay, what's this got to do with this conference and um, inclusion the rest of it? Well, imagine giving this to someone with um, learning difficulties, with Windows on, or Ubuntu on, and they keep prompting them, do you want to update your computer? What are they going to answer to that? Yes? No? Don't know? Leave it? Close it and hope the problem goes away? Well, if we've got a secure operating system, we hope that they don't have to worry about that anymore. Now, I expect the operating system won't be perfectly secure. It never has been to date in the history of computing. It's unlikely that Google's getting it right the first time. I'd be very surprised. However, one of the things that companies have to do a lot more of recently is we open source our software very, very early. So Chrome and Chrome OS, Chrome is the browser, Chrome OS is the browser on a minimalist operating system. We've open sourced all of it. All the source code is out there. Now what that means is that you could, I say you, not personally, because I doubt most of you ever want to do this perverse stuff, but you can actually download our source code, build your own operating system and use it. There's nothing to stop you doing that apart from the wherewithal, the technical wherewithal, and the patience. Most of you have better things to do than write program code. But. So we're actually putting it out there for other people to try. We're giving away, in many ways, the assets of the company. And again, it sounds sort of paradoxically, why, why would the heck can you do that? Other companies make their billions out of selling operating systems. Now, I think one of the reasons we do this is because we're disrupting technologies. We're disrupting patterns. And I'll talk about that as well with the Android phone. So we're changing the mindset of people. So the first thing is, if you look at fast food, then newer notebooks now come with a second operating system on them. HPs do, for instance. And what you can do is boot into that to use the web. And it takes, let's say, 20 seconds. So by Google Chrome saying, Chrome OS, that we're going to do it in a few seconds, other people say, hang on, ah, oh, we could solve that problem too. So what it means is, it isn't just Google doing it now, but it's many people doing it. So we're changing the mindset of people. And I suspect what will happen is some of you end up talking to each other over the next day or so, and you'll realize that someone else is doing something you never thought was possible. And I suspect three days later you'll be doing it too. But unless you talk to that person, you wouldn't know that. You'd be stuck believing, well, I can't do that because it's too difficult. And they say, ah, actually, you're just going to try this website and download this piece of software. It might just do what you want. It may not be quite what you want, but you'll be up and running a few hours later. So that's the sort of thing where we're trying to encourage that sort of behavior. I'm going to go back to the ones and twos and how it applies to you. So Google is several tens of thousands of people, I think roughly 20,000 people in total, probably 10,000 engineers roughly, give or take a few thousand. 
So quite a technology-centric company. But as I say, the typical teams are relatively small. And also, if we look at things like accessibility for the mobile phones, and I'll talk about that in a moment, the work was done by two engineers, one of them blind, and the other one was an inter, a student. So I'll move on to the mobile phone software and then talk about Android, which is our platform for mobile phones. So how many of you are blind here? I know these two or three people are. So three people perhaps are blind? Okay. So there's a chap called T.B. Ram at Google. He's quite well known in the community, and he's blind. Uh, he's Indian, he was blind from the age of about 14, and he's now in his mid-40s. Although he would probably tell you he's 30-something. Very handsome. <laughs> anyway, um, so he went to the Android team. Oh, sorry, let me go back a little bit. How many of you use Nokia and Nokia, the Nuance Talk software? I assume that, yes, quite a few of you, so four or five. And it's a very special piece of software. And it's a wonderful piece of software because it enables your phone to talk to you. And over the years, that software has been developed. And for the other people who use JAWS and screen readers, again, this software has been developed to solve a need. So when TV Ramon came over to the UK about three years ago, I met him. And I gave him a Nokia phone because my job was mobile phone testing. And I bought a copy of the newest software. Maybe it cost 150 pounds, I forget. And he then took the phone back to the US and used it as his main phone. And this was the first time he had a, a normal mainstream phone rather than a specialist one designed for the blind. And it was all well and good until he bought another phone, because people are perverse and buy new technology even though the old one works. And he had to transfer the license over. And the license maybe cost 50 pounds to transfer, but I remember I had to pay for it on my credit card. Now, how many of you same people would pay 50 pounds because you've got a new phone? How many of you wouldn't pay £50? Pounds? Just an invert question. Okay, a few of you. Why not? What would you do instead? So, uh, sorry, um, Guy, since you're in the front row. Pick them on me. I don't know about buying the phone. So I, you just wouldn't... It, I just see it as a tax on it. Okay, so you wouldn't buy the phone. So that's one good counter argument. But the has already bought the phone. It's too late for that. He's a technologist. He works at Google. He's probably got 50 phones now. Anyway. So his solution wasn't to pay 50 pounds, actually I bought it, but never mind, he didn't pay it. He spent nine months writing the software to replace that with the Android platform. Now let's imagine you're the Android software development team. The product isn't launched yet, it's the Google operating system platform, and you imagine that you're under immense pressures to ship. I assume that most of you are under immense pressures to do good things at work. So what do you do if someone comes up to you with a madcap idea saying, um, I'm blind, I want to use a touchscreen phone. They laughed at him. I said, oh, you know what, let's be serious about this. Um, and so they sort of ignored him. But he's a very stubborn individual. And so he went back, and we have this thing called TJF, which is a Friday where we have the founders speak, and they have beer and pizza typically. It's a wonderful event. And you have an open mic session. Anyone can walk up and ask questions. So Ramon walked up and said, hey, why can't I have one of these phones? So eventually, the Android team gave him a couple of them and said, go away. So then what happens, he wrote the whole um, talking software for the phone and open sourced it. And this was one blind engineer doing it part time with another intern who helped him write some of the code. Put it on the, on the web. And of course it isn't perfect, it doesn't do everything, it doesn't speak when the browser's used. But that software's now being integrated into the core platform. And that's two people part time. And Google is one of the very unusual companies, I think, that still allows that to happen, even though we're a relatively large company. So what I'm trying to encourage you to do is to say, hang on, not that I'm part of a big organization or that I've got, I don't know any of your circumstances, but I assume that you're all part of relatively big things like schools or further education or charities. Um, but what can I do that's different? How can I solve this problem and make something useful happen? And when you start to look at problems from that perspective, I expect that you'll find some of the solutions. So I'll move on to the Google Android platform now. So let's go back five years in mobile phones. I was suspecting most of you had Nokia phones. Certainly 60, 70% of the market had Nokia phones in Europe. Um, the phones cost, well, it depends if they're subsidized or not. In the UK, most of our phones are subsidized. They're paid for by your contracts. So you pay over 18 months, 30 pounds a month, which is about 500 pounds. Um, and out of that, probably 150, 200 pounds pays for the phone. The phone is closed source software. Do you remember the Nuance Speak software, or the Nuance Talk software? 150 pounds. 
And applications are typically sold for the phone and were relatively expensive. Uh, and there were millions of phones, about billions of the, the Nokia phones out there. But the Android platform is open source and it's free. So companies don't pay to use it. You don't pay to use it. If you wanted to make your own phone and run Android software, you can do that. Again, barring all the technical challenges of making all that work. There's no financial burden beyond that. So by taking the software and making it free, um, we actually built on the work of Apple, in that Apple changed the marketplace of phones with the iPhone. How many of you have iPhones here? Yeah, so about a quarter of you, perhaps even as many as a third of you. And why do you have the iPhone when it's ultimately, I haven't got a keyboard, and this is actually an Android phone, but there's no keyboard on this thing, and it's a phone, and surely it's got a keyboard. But because the user interface and the user experience was so wonderful and innovative, people loved them and people bought them in droves. They queued outside the store. So the Googlers, when the iPhone was launched in the UK, I think they queued for eight hours outside the, the store in London to go and buy one. And that for technology geeks is something. And they can normally buy it on the internet and click a couple of buttons and it just arrives at the box tomorrow morning. But they actually queued to get these devices. And so they changed the ground. And if you look at all the manufacturers, they all moved to touchscreen uh, devices within six to nine months. So Apple changed that game, and I'm really pleased they did. The Android phone, again, has changed the game. If you look at what happened to the uh, Nokia software, which is from a company called Symbian, how many of you have ever heard of Symbian? Okay, quite a few of you. But Symbian was a UK-based company with lots of funding, and shortly after Android was launched, then Symbian was open-sourced. It was put into a, a, a charitable foundation, uh, it's no longer a business, and it's supported by, I think, Nokia and Sony Ericsson. You can check on the internet for the details. But the game changed at that point, and it changed because of disruptive technologies. So the Android software is now available on something like 50 different phones. I personally own more than 10 of them, so I'm fairly sad. Um, I fiddle with technology far too much. But it's becoming commonplace, and it's changing the way people think about software, because now it's relatively easy to develop the software. There's no license fee to pay to write your own software for it. There are toolkits. I'll move on to the children. None of you have asking questions, so I'm just going to keep yattering until eventually something stops me. Excuse me. What does Android software do? Android software, um, well, by analogy, what phone have you got? I just got my iPhone yesterday. Okay, so the iPhone is a lump of hardware, like this, and inside there's some software, and the software is written by Apple, and it's called the iPhone software, the iPhone operating system, and you're running probably version 3, you've just bought a new phone. So all that software is written by Apple, and they maintain all the source code, and they keep it in Apple. <coughs> so if you wanted to know how the software works, you'd have to work for Apple, and get permission to work on that application to know how it works. So Android is the equivalent for this. This is a phone from a company called HTC, but there are also a bunch of other companies like Samsung and Motorola, who all take they design a wonderful piece of hardware, and this one happens to have a little kick shape, and a nice little trackball, and a fancy camera. This one's another one with a different funny shape on it, and a different camera. And there are 50 other phones like this, some with keyboards, some without. Um, all of them, though, are running the Android software inside them, which is the thing that keeps the phone running. And it does everything from starting up the phone, enabling you to make phone calls, to using the internet, to being the web browser, to your calendar, your email, and everything else. Does that answer your question? Question about it? Sorry, I just want to make sure I've answered your question. Uh, yes, it's basically a phone, it's a software platform for you, for phones. And That's right. Source. Yes, and there are two parts to it, to be strictly accurate. There's a the part that is open source, which is all the underlying fundamentals in the phone, including the web browser, and there are parts that belong to Google, and those are things like the email client and the calendar clients, and those we don't open source um, because they're part of the, the, the Google software that we need to um, manage. So there, there's two sides to it. Um, I will I'll come back to you in a second. I want to make one other point about um, how many of you with the, how many of you haven't got an iPhone or an Android phone? So how often have you updated the software on your phone? Never. Okay, that's fairly typical. So let's imagine that your phone's more than a year old. How many of you have a phone more than a year old? Okay, quite a few of you, good. So this is just to give you an example. So your phone's more than a year old, and the software is out of date. But the software can't be updated. 
in practice because you'd have to plug it into your computer, you'd have to download, if you're a Nokia phone, you have to download the Nokia software, which is 100 megabytes, and you don't have to install and know how to run it. Then you have to connect to their update server and then update your phone. None of you are going to do that. You haven't yet. I doubt you'll do it tomorrow or the day after. You've got better things to do with life. If you look at the iPhone, your phone is running the latest software, with rare exceptions. If you bought one last year, it's still running the up-to-date software now. It comes a little prompt when you plug it into iTunes and says, a new version's available, do you want to update it? And you click, I don't know, okay. You know, phone's updated, great. Go about your business. So Android is the same thing. The phone gets updated automatically, which means that new features are available, and security fixes are there, and performance improvements are there, just because you use the phone. So it changes the model slightly. Uh, your question. Uh, how many applications are, are available to the Android? Not as many, so I don't know the real numbers, I'm going to guess 50%. But ask me again in a year's time, and I suspect you'll find that the, the gap is closing. Um, there's some, so I've got an Android phone, and although it seems like there's lots of great apps and things out there, it's, it appears that they're all hidden, and trying to, trying to search through the menu will just find something. You know, a friend of mine showed me something for screen reading, basically, on an iPhone, we can take a photo of some text and you can read that to you. I thought, great, we're going to do something like that for the Android and just did no way to be in. Yes, it's paradoxical for a company that's involved in search. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it is one of the areas to, to, um, to improve, I think, in terms of finding the applications. Um, what more can I say? So a friend of mine at Google happens to have written an application that scans in text from a page uploads it to Google Documents, runs the OCR engine on the server, and downloads the text in a couple of seconds and reads out the text aloud. He wrote it in half a day, the first version of it, and of course it, it buggy and it crashes. But he wrote it in half a day. So, and he did it himself with no special inside Google knowledge, he just used standard open um, tools available. So that's the sort of thing that says, you don't have to have an advanced degree in doing this development. You can actually get away with doing something with relatively little skills. I mean, it's still programming skills, computer science skills, but we still have a few students doing computer science in this country, don't we? You know, there's a few people like Dick and me, you know, we did it in the past. So there's hope for the industry, yes. So let me move back to education and Android then. So Google um, Research um, ended up developing a little toolkit and the toolkit's aimed at children, and I'll say the children and their teens, it's actually much broader than that. But the idea was, how can we take technology and make it part of the classroom? Now, are any of you teachers? Okay, a few of you teachers. What do you think about mobile phones in the classroom? Okay, good, I've got one positive. <laughs> so your kids are allowed to text and email and use their Facebook all the way through their classes, regardless of whether it's history, French, PE, it could be video of each other, I don't want to. Okay, so it's basically looking at how can we change the mindset of saying rather than phones being a pest and if a child is seen to be using it in the classroom, it could get confiscated, what could we do with this device if we could make it part of the classroom experience? And so, as part of that, Google ended up developing um, another little project, which is again free to use. Um, that enables children to develop a software application. So it's a sort of drag and drop um, jigsaw type of building block application. It's called App Inventor. If you decide you want to use it, we haven't got it as a full open um, product yet. So you, you'd have to um, request sign up, but then just speak to me later if you want to do that. Uh, the main reason being that it's a little bit rough around the edges and you'll need a little hand holding, I expect. But um, a university in the States has written the tutorials for it. I found them on the web. So I didn't even know they were doing it, but I was searching for stuff. It's written pages and pages and tutorials. So the material's starting to be there. So one of the other important messages I want to encourage you to do is to open source your software. If you end up writing software or paying someone to write software, how will you do this stuff? Then open source it. So Google, I can't give you exact numbers, but we are open sourcing, I'm guessing, let's say half of our software now. And again, you sort of think, well, we're throwing away the crown jewels here. But the idea being is that the software is out there and it outlives us. It isn't just for us to use. Now, it could be that the world ignores it. Most of you are ignoring our software. You know, you don't care about what we open source. You never need to know, hopefully. But 
if in five years' time you decided you didn't want to know, you'd go back and get the software and you could build our browser, you could build our phone operating system, you could build the hacky little screen reader stuff that I wrote, um, and you can use that. I may have lost interest in this, I may have been killed in a car accident, but you can get my source code and choose to do what you want with it, even if you just want to delete it and, and make it a pretty paper mache thing from printing it out. I don't mind, it's there for you. So too often we have pieces of software that someone starts and then for whatever reason it doesn't get funded next year, so you have to stop on it. And either it atrophies at that point, or you put it out on the internet and someone just might pick it up and use it. Now there is a slight burden for open sourcing software, I suggest. It isn't quite as simple as just copying all my source directories and putting it on a server and declaring victory. So it's good to provide some sort of guidelines and introduction and explain the rationale behind it. So that someone else following after you, a bit like an archaeologist, can read the clues. They don't have to rely just on the fossils, which is the source code. So I would encourage you to, to open source it and put a few words around it and write some sort of tutorial. Get a friend, a friend with the relevant skills to try it out and get their comments and incorporate that into the documentation. Let's see if there's anything else I was going to talk about. Oh, I guess. Another thing. So I have a friend. Um, he lives in Copenhagen, or in that area, actually in Aarhus, which is just outside. And he's a very bright man, my age, in his 40s, perhaps even 50 years old. And he has children. How many of you have children? <laughs> okay, quite a few of you. So Denmark's got one of the best national health services in the world. So if you want to fall ill somewhere, fall ill in Denmark. You'll be wonderfully treated. So his youngest boy was diagnosed with autism at age 8. I don't know if you have to deal with special needs and kids with autism. So what happens in Denmark when a child who's got autism gets a 16? What do you think happens? He gets it. He gets the old age pension. He was deemed at the time as not able to work. So simply have the old age pension, it's, it's a good pension, so that's fine. Now what? Well, actually, if you look at some of the people in our industry, in my industry, they're probably autistic. They're certainly on the Asperger's syndrome, some of them. They've got attention to detail, brilliant minds, but they're different. Yes, they don't always talk to you, but if you've ever tried to talk to a programmer, you'll know they're not always from the same world that you're from. <laughs> so you kind of get used to that. So you can either say, well, hang on, he's autistic, he can't work, or he's different from me, but how do I interact with this person and help them, and vice versa, how can they help me? So all this chap did is he resigned his job. He was some IT consultant, probably quite senior, and he set up a company employing people who had registered with autism. And you sort of think, what madness is this? But if we look at the skills of autistic people, and I'm looking at the Spurgeon syndrome, I'm looking at the people who are entirely, you know, the, the most extreme end of the spectrum, they have incredible attention to detail. They remember things. They can spot patterns in data. And my brother has two autistic boys. And um, the, the one who's um, more communicative is great until something goes wrong and then he asks you a thousand questions. That can either be really, really, really annoying or it actually becomes really useful if you need someone to do that. So this business is built around that. It's built around people with those skills and finding a way to enable them to work in a commercial environment. So for instance, Microsoft has worked with this company and gets outsourced some of their work to them because they've got skills that their average employees, who are sane and got a life and want to go home, um, don't want to do. You know, please can you test this software again for the 37th time of testing it? I'm bored. I'm really bored. I, I'm not very good at doing the same thing twice in life. So I'm not a good person to do regression testing of the same piece of software. I'm talking about software testing tomorrow if you're interested. So I'm a bad example. But for someone who's willing to go back through this, Time and time again, they'll spot the problems that I've missed. The other area they're very good is security testing. Because security testing is mostly about coping with rejection and failure. Can I break into this software? I spend hours or days trying to break in, and the best result is I don't break in. It's a bit like being a salesperson called calling. You try, you try, you try, you give up. Now, if you're someone who's easily discouraged, you stop at that point, and you go and do something else where you get you know, praise and money and girls or whatever it is that people want in life, I don't know. Um, but you know, something else. But for people with autism, sometimes they're willing to keep going and keep going and keep going. 
And of course, it can keep going the wrong direction. So perhaps it did a bit of help to point in the right direction. And he's made a commercial business out of this. And they've now set up a company in Glasgow in the UK to do something similar. And there's a company in Japan who's followed the same model. Now, the company's called Specialista, and he's called Thorkill Sonner. Because it's been videoed, then at least the video remembers it, the rest of you have forgotten by tomorrow morning. But come ask me later on, and I'm happy to tell you more about this work. I'm just so impressed about the way they work. And I happened to go for their um, summer company outing. Again, it sounds a bit unusual for a company of autistic people to go out. I went out into the fields and had a barbecue. And they chatted to me. But what I like best about the company is that probably 80% of the people are autistic on the autism spectrum. Um, and uh, they actually talk about the normals. Because they're the, they're, the, they're the specials, and they're the majority, and the normals are the poor misguided people who aren't as good as they are. And that happens to be me, by the way. So they've changed the whole mindset around from, oh, that's the special needs person, to actually they're the experts, and I'm the weird one in this relationship. OK. Uh, anything else I want to talk about? I think we're getting close to our time, so I just thought it might be useful to open the floor to any particular questions. Can I just ask about Google Wave? Yes. Whether you're happy with the uptake of it? Because I and lots of people I know sort of immediately signed up for an account. And then since then, we've sort of sat and looked at it, wondering what to do with it. I think that the challenge for Wave is to find a useful way of using it. It's, it's something that's so alien and unusual that until you see it demonstrated, then it's hard to think of, what the heck do I do with this thing? So you give me a nice toy, but now what? Um, but when you see someone else using it, like the deaf, for instance, you say, hang on, now I get it. So the example I gave you is a conference where we didn't know what would happen when we had 100 people, but we were very pleasant surprised because people contributed and wrote up the notes in real time. So the rest of you are sitting around who weren't typing, we'd actually have to read the transcription in pretty much real time, you know, maybe a minute or two behind, and we didn't coordinate anyone. It just happened, osmotically, from these people. They didn't know how to use it at the beginning, but a, a day and a half later, they loved it. Now, Wave isn't very good for a solo person. You sit and you can type in real time, you interact with yourself in real time, it doesn't really fit. If there are two of you, it's unlikely to be particularly useful, but perhaps a hundred people, it starts to get the um, sort of the catalytic effect that means it, it comes to life. So I don't know what the numbers are for Perth Wave. I'm not close enough to the team to be able to comment on those things. But I would expect that it's, it's going to go through and change. I know it's changing in terms of how it operates and user interfaces and the rest of it. And who knows where it will be in a couple of years' time. It needs to get to a sort of critical mass. Well, I would think it, it may just take off. I mean, the weirdest things take off, like Twitter. I mean, I've been up to SMS for 15, 20 years. What's the big deal? Like an SMS on a website, you know, it doesn't make any sense to me. But even I've signed up for Twitter now. I'm generally adverse to all these social networking things. But it finally makes sense to me, and it's relatively simple. Like 140 characters or less, type in a little web interface or on my mobile phone, and I can sort of share information for people I don't really want to communicate with individually. And so we probably will have an epiphany a bit like that. But maybe it won't be Google Wave, maybe it'll be Yahoo, why Wave? Or why not Wave? Or <laughs> <laughs> why not, why not Wave? You know, I don't know if you get to the end of this. Uh, and maybe someone else who, who comes up with something similar. So I don't know. I'm not sure I answered your question, but I've done my best now. Question here? Um, sorry, um, the woman next to us. So I'll see you next. Okay. Um, you say about Google Wave. Um, and you, you talked a lot about making a lot of your applications open source. Yes. Um, one of the things I'm conscious of with Google Wave, and that cuts a lot of people off, is that you've got to sign up for an account. It's the same with a lot of them. Are you going to take any steps towards making it more open, as in you don't have to register for an account? Or? I don't know. So that is the thing I have no idea about. I mean, typically we have people sign up for accounts, but it's as much for privacy as anything else. Um, because it's ultimately your data. And one thing I'd like to mention about Google, and this is perhaps a bit of VR, but never mind, is that we actually have declared that the users own their data. And given I've lived in the IT industry for 20 years and been stuck with incompatible file formats or the fact that I used to have a CompuServe account, you know, and now that's long gone, but 
if I didn't save the data out at the right time, the right format, I'd never see it again. So Google's actually said, you can see how we use your data across all our systems, and if you want to take your data out, you can. And again, it sounds paradoxical that we would make it so open to people to, to move, because one of the things that the industry traditionally do, does is lock people in. It's great that you lock people in, you get them to pay maintenance and upgrade fees, and that's more than 25 to 32%. Any of you who've been involved in IT purchasing know that you just keep paying this money until something else happens. So if you can take your data out of the Google stuff and it's free or virtually free to you, um, how does it benefit us? Well, it benefits us because you're more likely to trust us with, our, with your data, knowing that you can get it back out again. So it's a bit like if I went to a station and they have a, a, you know, these left luggage things, and it says only out open between the hours of 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. in the morning on Thursdays. The chance of me putting anything in that locker is slim or not. But if it says always open, and there's a security guard standing there who's going to check that I'm the right person, going to check myself, I'll throw every damn thing on me in the locker, because then I can walk around the streets of Paris or wherever I am and enjoy myself. So that's the idea and the mindset of this. And I think it's important not just for Google to do this, but for everyone to do this, to share the data and make it easily available. And so the account is part of the protection of that. And I think if we had it, and this is me speaking individually, but I think having it totally anonymous might cause much more sort of spam behavior. Spam is a big enough problem in our industry anyway, even when people do create accounts. So um, it's an unsolved problem. Uh, personally, I don't mind having logins. So my problem is remembering all the passwords I've got. And you all have different rules of passwords. You know, this one you can't put dashes, and this one you must put a number, and this one's going to be eight layers long, and this one can't be more than six long. Oh, that's what they use for that one. I can't remember. Anyway, that's my problem, old age. Have we got time for a couple more questions? Only one comment. I'm oh, sorry, yes, Arthur was next. Okay. Um, only one comment for the, um, uh, how deaf, the deaf community probably um, embrace way for the direct uh, communication. It's not completely new for the deaf community because in the 60s, Andrew Sachs uh, was one of the first connected to teletype writers through the phone system that uh, two deaf persons can communicate instantly to each other and uh, seeing the letters directly. Uh, on the other side. So it's the direct communication, not even line by line like instant messaging, but directly. And I'm doing the same, the same when I'm communicating with my deaf friends. So usually I, t I take my, my laptop with my screen read on it, turn it around that they can type in a regular um, text editor and I use an external keyboard and my headphones and type it on the same computer. And it works quite well so I can listen what He's typing, and I, what I'm typing, and uh, he can see. So it's probably a similar experience, I think. Yes, and I'm glad you've given all the examples. It says you don't need all this fancy technology. People did it even with simple technology um, 30 years ago. And again, sometimes the solutions are deceptively simple. Um, and one thing with Arthur is that we can look at Google Wave from a couple of different perspectives. So one is saying we've got to make the user interface work with the screen reader. And we've got to make it interact with the screen reader. And Arthur and I have a difference of opinion on this, so I'll, I'll say that openly. The other is saying, what is it that you want to do with this piece of software? How's it going to help you? And if you can provide equivalent functionality that works well with you, and he gave an example here of two keyboards and that their headphones, the way of communicating. How many other people here who are sighted would bother to do that? It's probably none of you. But for him and his friend, that's how technology helps them. And so what I'm trying to encourage within Google with you is to find ways to do this in your world, for your friends. So I met someone at, um, at the Android, we had an Android event on Friday evening, um, with lots of developers from the London area. And one of them came up to say that um, he's working on something similar for um, a woman with cerebral palsy. And he met her in the supermarket, and apparently she asked him to pass the tin of beans out or something. And he happened to notice a few minutes later she was in another aisle and asked, um, you know, for someone else to help, and they didn't help, they were ignoring her or whatever, so he went around and helped her. So I'm cutting a long story short, I probably shouldn't go into too many details, because these are not my direct friends or acquaintances, is that he's actually worked on software that helps someone um, who's got physical impairments to use technology to communicate. And he's just done that, as, you know, him for a friend. And it happens to be that the software is written maybe other people can use, and so he'll share it with other people. But it's changing the mindset around and solving a particular problem with two people. And then hopefully the bigger companies like Google and Yahoo can find ways to raise that up another level and solve not just the 
point-to-point -point communications of you with you and you with you and you with you, but across all of you. Okay, one last question. Have you got to tonight? Oh, no, sorry, uh, the woman in the back with green and red, do you still want to talk? Did you, you put your hand up a couple of years ago. Yeah, I, um, what I was interested in was you, you talked a lot about solutions for particular groups, like deaf people or um, people who are blind. But um, what about people whose needs, which uh, are wide range of people, whose needs change over time? Uh, my mum. My mum is 70 now. I went to see her yesterday um, in Whitby. And she was a school teacher, uh, an English school teacher. She's a polyglot, speaks um, I don't know how many languages, um, used to teach English to foreign language to people, and so learned uh, Gujarati and Hindi and all sorts of other languages. Um, and she used to empty libraries. She's scary when she's around with library cards because she was simply take out 10, 20 books at a time. But she's 70 now, and it turns out that she's got a problem with her sight. The eyes work, but the brain doesn't. The brain's no longer interpreting the information correctly. And she reads books. I mean, when I go to the house, it's full of books. Um, so she's now got this horrible problem, knowing that her sight's going, and knowing that when she gets tired, she can no longer focus on the words. So at the moment, there are a bunch of different solutions. She can go to her local library and get talking books. And talking books, um, if you're registered um, with visual impairments, I think are free from the library. If not, you pay a pound or two a week for them. But I suspect she goes through them in a month. And then what? She's got another 12 months or 11 months to, to, to want to read. So um, we're now left with another problem. Well, it could be that she registers with the RMIB and she gets what's called daisy books. Now, daisy books have been around for tens of years, and typically they have specialist hardware um, that you basically buy or someone pays for, whether it's a government or a charity, and probably costs, let's say, a thousand pounds. And then you get talking books, and you listen to talking books, and you send it back. And they have millions of titles available as talking books. So I was at the Tech Share RNIB conference in uh, October, which is why I'm here now, uh, through Sal seeing me there. And um, a couple of people came up to me saying, it'd be really nice if you had a book reader for the mobile phone, for these things. And it'd be even nicer if it was free in Tint, your Google, can you do it for free? Oh, and you know, you might have open source it. So that's what I've done. I basically, in my spare time, I'm not a very good programmer, but I've been writing Java program for the Android phone to read the, first of all, talking books, which is the, the main one the RIB supports. In the US, they happen to use a newer version of the standard, which is called Data 3, and I've now had to modify the software to do that. And I say I, but actually I've got a blind developer at the RIB who's collaborating with me. I have a couple of other blind developers who are working for other major technology companies I won't name here. Um, but they're helping out in this because they see there's a useful need here. So I think to come back to answer your question, because I've got a little sidewalk there, is we should find ways to help use technology that means that my mum doesn't have to hold her hand up and say, actually, I think I'm going blind now, but hey, I can still read the books, but I just use this little phony computery thing that does it for me now. And you have done that, then there's no shame of her using it. In fact, it's pretty cool, and I can listen to books on it. So I'm sighted, but I like it. Does that answer your question? Nail me if you want. Come on, tell me what I haven't answered. Well, what about, say, I was thinking more of perhaps, say, the person with MS. Yeah. Who's, who might be able to read the books, but they can't read the use the touchpad one day, and then the next day their tremor is such that they can't So, Or their eyesight is okay one day, and then the next day it's not. So the first thing is I don't think this is a solved problem from anyone. If you think it's being solved by someone else, then please tell me who solved it. So I expect that the solution will be piecemeal, at least at first, for the next, let's say, five years. Um, and we'll end up half solving the problem. So this chap I was telling you about from Friday, he happens to be working with him with MS, and he, uh, not MS, sorry, with, uh, what was it MS, sorry, I think MS, I may be confused, but forgive me. So anyway, she's got um, um, uh, physical impairments, and he's finding a way to enable her to use um, the movements and gestures to control the phone. But then let's imagine that woman's also got epilepsy, and so she's got a seizure, and now when she holds the phone, of course, you know, all the, the gestures are so large that they dwarf the normal gestures we're expecting. 
But is there a way that we can still help her communicate? I have a friend whose daughter has cerebral palsy, and she's probably 12 now, and she communicates either with her eyes or with two head switches that are here. And she lives in a wheelchair, and she's on a drip, and all the rest of it. And they've solved the problem by doing several things. They're having the head switch, by looking at eye tracking software, and trying different ones out, because some of them don't work very well, because their head moves so much, and some software works well with that, some doesn't. And ultimately, I'll say you, come just be a picker out you. But you could buy the software for this phone, or for the iPhone, or for the Nokia phone, or for a, you know, a computer that solves that problem for that person. And it probably won't be perfect, but would it be better than the alternative of not having anything? I suspect it will be. And then someone perhaps else in this room will take your software and say, hey, it's really good work here, but I've noticed it doesn't work in this situation when a person has seizures. I think I've got a solution for that. Do you mind if I have a go? I'm hoping that you'll build on each other's work. And since I'm way over time, I'll come back to the Google way of working. And one of the reasons I stay in this company is that we're encouraged to build on each other's work. Our source code is shared within the engineers. So I can pick up someone else's source code and modify it, and we have checks and balances to make sure it's of reasonable quality. But that's what we're encouraged to do. You see a problem, you fix it. So I encourage you all, by like closing marks of the night, is when you see a problem, or someone needs help to fix it. And ask me if you need help on that. Thank you.